Hey guys. Um, my name is Devin Pluler. I uh, work at Toronto FC. Uh, I've been there about, uh, well, this is my third season. We're about halfway through. Um, and uh, I've been around the soccer analytics uh, scene for uh, a little while. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a handful of uh, different things. Uh, I assume a few of you at least are students, so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of uh, the path into uh, you know a, a professional organization as you know uh, as an employee, right? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my role is at this club. I'm going to talk about um, some of the specific things that we do and some of the leading metrics in soccer analytics. Um, and then I'm going to talk about kind of some of the, uh, the, the uh, problems in the application uh, of some of this stuff, right? Uh, analytics isn't just the numbers, it's how do we go from numbers to um, you know, kind of deploying these things. Uh, so I am uh, this guy. So I'm a computer scientist. Um, uh, I, uh, but uh, before that, uh, I grew up a, a soccer player. Uh, played soccer from a very young age, um, and I was a, I was a goalkeeper. I was a, a pretty good goalkeeper. Um, good enough to play college in uh, at a, a pretty poor college team. Um, you know, it was uh, kind of one of those where you know when you grow up uh, a a medium fish in a very small pond type situation. So I, uh, um, so uh, yeah. So uh, I had a, a, a pretty good soccer background. Uh, you know, also quite a nerd. So I, I studied computer science in college. And uh, what was great about uh, Wentworth's uh, computer science program was that uh, it had a co-op program. And the co-op that I had during school was at a great uh, astrophysics uh, lab at Harvard. Um, and here I got a chance to work with a lot of different, um, uh, really just straight up geniuses. Yeah, these, you know, I, uh, I was brought in to help them uh, with some computer science related things. Um, you know, uh, they had all these kind of interesting astrophysics problems. Um, I, uh, and I had the computer science skills to help them kind of apply that. Uh, but what was really, really interesting about these guys was that they kind of picked up computer science because they needed to. It was a tool set for their problem. And for me, you know, uh, I thought that was really neat. Uh, I had this toolkit to kind of apply to some interesting problems, but I didn't really have a cool problem to work with. There was nothing I was really passionate with other than soccer. Um, kind of at this point, I read Moneyball and kind of, you know, that, uh, that uh, light bulb went off to a lot of degrees. Um, and uh, you know, started dealing a bit more with data. I got my hands on a company called Opta, which you might see further down the list here. I got a hold of some of their data, kind of illegally, and um, you know, and uh, started blogging about it, um, which was which was great um, because instead of suing me, they hired me later on. Um, but somewhere in between, I started writing, using this data, writing about this in a blog, getting. Uh, uh, various amount of uh, attention and publicity uh, to the point where uh, Major League Soccer picked up on it. I was just you know promoting my stuff on Reddit, and uh, one of their lead writers thought some of this stuff was really cool and invited me off to kind of start uh, writing on that website. And that kind of steamrolled into Opta finally offering me a job, which was great. And at that you know place, I would work with teams all over the world doing different consultancy projects. Uh, working with teams um, in terms of uh, opposition analysis on coach recruitment to uh, performance forecasting, all kinds of different things that are pretty similar to uh, what I do now. Uh, but one of the major frustrations of working with Opta kind of as a consultant is I kind of was parachuting in and out of problems, right? I um, would, um, you know, put together a, a, I think a pretty valuable piece of analysis and that information, that report would be dropped on that decision maker's desk and I really had no idea where it went from there. Um, I had no idea if that report was read, I have no idea if that report was acted on and then learned on and there was never kind of a cyclical process to, the, to that proce uh, cyclical process, to that process, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Uh, you know, these, uh, I, I didn't have a chance to kind of learn from these things so I kind of felt like in order for me to really uh, be able to uh, implement this kind of stuff, I, I needed to get inside of a club. 
And uh, kind of at that point, you know, through various connections I had met, at, you know, uh, made at conferences similar to this, uh, I was connected with a friend of mine in Toronto who is still our analytics consultant, um, and uh, they uh, brought me in uh, full time. Um, so it's kind of interesting, and I'm going to talk about a, a major problem in, I think, soccer analytics, but also probably sports analytics as a whole, is that clubs have no idea how to hire uh, quantitative analysts, right? Um, usually when you're hiring an analyst, uh, at this point in time, you're, is almost always the first analyst that this team is hiring. They don't have anybody who's qualified. There's no club incumbent to run that interview. There's nobody who's able to, you know, kind of check if the models that you're building are good or that your, um, you know, programming skills are up to snuff. They have kind of no idea. So there's only kind of a few ways that I think that you can kind of um, kind of get around this. Is one is kind of these connections, like which I developed through uh, you know the guy who's our consultant, uh, but also I think through uh, blogging as well, right? I, I think that allows you to build up a certain number uh, amount of social cachet inside of the you know analytics or uh, analytics kind of uh, community, so that if people know that you're good and, and that information, you know that's. Uh, that reputation follows you around, that helps those clubs out quite a bit because they know you have a good reputation inside the community, you know, it's a lot easier for them to take a risk on you um, when other people are vouching for you. Um, so a little bit about kind of my role at Toronto. Uh, one of the major things, one of the first things here is uh, data warehousing, analysis, modeling, and this is our software stack. Uh, everything that we use is completely built from scratch. Um, we use a you know MySQL front on the back end, uh, which I'm hoping to move to something a little bit more robust kind of soon. Uh, R for data, data modeling, Python for kind of a, a general process uh, and general usage uh, language. Uh, Django, which is related to Python, of course, for our web framework. So like just like kind of every single analytics organization you hear in terms of a professional sports team, everybody kind of has their own internal portal, which is where like coaches and GMs access all that information. We use Django for that, and D3 is a JavaScript framework that I use for building all the different data visualization stuff on top of that. Um, so that's great. Um, and these, uh, you know, um, and this is a very intrinsically related to kind of research development. It's a very cyclical cycle here. Um, cyclical cycle, that's kind of redundant. Um, but uh, so while, uh, you know, Data warehousing and modeling is, is kind of the important um, you know, requirements to this job. If you're not able to kind of uh, build new things and develop things based on that, uh, you're, you're really not going anywhere very fast. But uh, the most important part is using the things that you come up with through this uh, process uh, to start delivering uh, kind of data-driven wisdom to your um, to your coaching staff, to your other decision makers, right? Um, very frequently, you know, I, I'm filing certain reports to the uh, coaching staff and uh, management in, you know, on, on various topics. And kind of the, the more math that I can keep out of it, the better. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not looking to give them the data. I'm looking to give them something that I've learned from the data. These are very kind of explicit um, kind of even tactical suggestions or concepts in very soccer language that are data driven and they're backed by hard numbers, but that's not necessarily how you're presenting them. Um, so, uh, where am I now? And just to kind of get a glimpse, a glimpse of uh, what kind of a modern analytics department is doing, at least in um, you know, Major League Soccer, uh, where we're kind of one of the maybe three teams with uh, kind of a major um, analytics investment. Uh, so I, I report to our general manager, uh, and uh, alongside him and our uh, major salary cap guy, who's a manager of uh, budget and roster, I think is his title. Um, so I do uh, various kind of roster and budget efficiency stuff, team forecasting, player valuation, uh, how much is this player worth, how much is this player going to be worth in a couple of years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, work very closely with the, co uh, the coaching staff. Um, and our performance analysis team in terms of doing opposition analysis and scouting. We're using all of this data, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more in a minute, uh, in terms of um, finding certain st uh, you know, statistically driven tactical trends uh, that are unique uh, or relatively unique to certain teams. 
Uh, so you'll be able to notice anything from this team plays in a very asymmetrical manner on the field or this team creates a lot of value uh, through this type of possession or things like that. And all those things go to the coaching staff and you know, scouting reports and you know, a, a very close kind of uh, you know, um, conversation throughout the week in terms of the, the game uh, planning process. Um, and a lot of that same stuff that we use for opposition analysis, we also use for uh, domestic and international player recruitments on the scouting side. Um, you know, all the kind of uh, models and frameworks that we've built uh, is uh, pretty relevant, not just on the stylistic kind of um, implications on the, the, the uh, opposition scouting side. We also want to use that same stuff to find players that maybe play the same style of play as us, might fit well into our system. Uh, so that has some di uh, direct implications on the scouting department. And there's also kind of the sports science side. Uh, I don't do as much as I probably want or should with the sports science guys. Um, they're uh, fairly self-sufficient. Um, they're a little bit closer to the, the players, so to speak. We're a little bit closer to the coaches. Um, they, uh, you know, uh, do have certain data warehousing and kind of um, injury uh, predictive modeling kind of requirements. Um, but, uh, you know, we only have a certain number of analytics guys to attack all the problems, so that's uh, hopefully something new for us in the future. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of talking about, that's cool. um, just kind of talking about a little bit of the data uh, that we deal with. On the left side here, uh, this is a, a raw uh, data feed from the company Opto, which of course is the company I used to work for. Uh, what this does, and you know, we've got a visualization of it on the right side, uh, is they code every single pass the X and the Y coordinates, as well as um, you know, uh, the origin and destination, and also kind of on-ball events like shots and tackles and interceptions and all those things, and code them throughout the course of the game. So you have a very specific uh, spatio-temporal look, uh, like point, data point on them. So I know you know which uh, event happened before and after each each other, right? Um, so this is great, but it's also very unstructured, right? So. We need to look at this and tons of this um, over you know, either a game or a season or sometimes multiple seasons for a team, for a player, things like that, and find, find insight. Um, so we're gonna talk about one of the main kind of metrics here, um, which I'm gonna segue into with this example here from this game during the 2014 World Cup uh, in Belo Horizonte where uh, the Germans took on the Brazilians, right? Now, one of the most important uh, stats in sports, and it's probably not just soccer here, is shots, right? Um, and, uh, you know, there's all, all those adages around, you know, you, you can't score unless you shoot, and whatever the exact verbiage is on that. Um, but uh, the problem is in soccer is um, shots uh, behave slightly differently than in some other sports. Um, so in this game, the, the Brazilians outshot the Germans 18 to 14. In a normal situation, you'd expect, well, you know, the, the, the Brazilians probably won this game. If they did, it may not have been by very much. Um, but, you know, maybe the, maybe the Germans got lucky on a couple of their shots. Um, especially with the context knowing that about one out of every nine shots resulted in a goal at that World Cup, right? So maybe, you know, the, the Brazilians might have scored two, the Brazilian, you know, the, the Germans might have scored one or two, right? Or something like that if we're, if we're going on just kind of base rates. Um, but the truth of the matter is the Germans won this game seven to one. And if we were to assume that all shots were made equal, all shots were converted at about this one out of every nine shots, uh, that kind of outcome, a 7-1 outcome in favor of Germany, would happen, you know, one out of every, I had the, the actual simulation numbers on here, I think it was something, you know, uh, on the, the tens of thousands, right? Like, this is a, uh, would be quite a hell of an outlier. Um, now, what I'm going to do here kind of is explain this concept called um, expected goals. Um, which helps uh, kind of provide a little bit of context around this. So these are all of the uh, shots from outside of the box, and I think it was the 2015 Major League Soccer season, right? So it's about nine per game, which amounts to around 3,000 shots, right? Um, that's a lot of them, right? Now, of those shots, only 98 of them were goals. So that's three out of every 100 shots. That's a 3% chance about on average, right? Now, if we compare this to the shots that were taken inside of the box, right, a little bit more, about 15 per game, you have 721 goals, or 15 shots every 100, uh, 15 goals 
every 100 shots, roughly a 15% chance. That's a huge difference, right? Uh, so we're starting to get this understanding of, oh, well, maybe shots aren't necessarily all made equal, like they kind of are in some of the other sports. Um, they, uh, you know, um, it's also kind of crazy to look at just kind of the, the amount of you know, sh you know, poor shots that are being attempted, right? Like, that's kind of shocking, right? The, you know, especially some of these you know, ones that are from quite, quite a distance, right? Um, like, uh, and, and I'll explain a little bit of those in a, little, in a minute, but um, it shows that very clearly players frequently are making bad decisions, right? You know, you expect there might be some shots from distance, there might be situations where there's no defensive pressure or the goalkeeper's out of position. Um, but to be shooting so regularly from these parts, uh, far distances uh, is pretty crazy, right? Uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit of the um, kind of psychology around that in a little bit too. Um, but just kind of uh, starting to break this down a little bit, you know, this is, uh, it gives us kind of a rough uh, probability, right? Uh, this isn't a great model. You pr I probably shouldn't have such high values out here in the corner. But um, it gives you a, a qu quite a breakdown in terms of, you know, once you're getting outside of that large bounds there, you have less than a 1% chance of scoring, or shots right around that kind of magic circle, funny lopsided circle, it's got a 10%. So suddenly, you know, uh, you know, you, you kind of realize where you're taking shots is uh, incredibly valuable, right? Especially if you're able to regularly and repeatedly find shots in that dangerous area versus taking kind of pot shots from the long, long distance. Um, and what's interesting is that quality of shot is not necessarily normally distributed. Um, teams attempt a, uh, a lot of bad shots, right? A huge majority of shots have less than a 10% chance of going in, right? Um, which is which is kind of shocking. Um, now this little uh, bump over here at 75, those are penalty kicks, uh, right? So that shows you just how much more valuable penalty kicks are than kind of your normal shot that's taken in the, the run of play. Um, and also what's interesting is that roughly 50% of goals come from the best 10% of shots, right? So teams that kind of their shot selection live in this area, those are your best teams in the league regularly, right? Um, so now, what, how is this useful? Um, it's really predictive, and it's actually looking at how good a team, uh, chances that a, a player or a team generates, we're gonna look at players here, is predictive how well they're going to be doing in the future. Um, so on the first column here, actually it's just the player number, uh, the second column is the number of uh, ex, you know, go, uh, total goals per 90, per game, 90 minutes in a soccer game, uh, that uh, players scored in a, a certain MLS season, 2015. Uh, and next to that is on their number of expected goals. So that is uh, their, given the quality of the chances that they attempted, given their location and, and certain other predictive measures around that that we've calculated, um, that we would expect them to score. Now, uh, and on the right, on the, 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 uh, on the fourth column, you have the following year's actual goals, right? So what you actually can find here is, while there is a correlation between goals in one year and goals in the next year, you actually find a stronger correlation if you look at their underlying chance generation, right? Uh, a player's expected goals is a better predictor for the following year's goals than uh, actual goals, which is kind of fascinating because um, transfer markets, players that are bought and sold in the global market are uh, so frequently paid and um, you know bought for their past performance, right? When we realize that you know a lot of this is just luck, you know. Um, so when we start to strip away some of these um, very you know uh, top level level kind of uh, stuff, you can get a, a much better understanding of the particular players that you're buying or you're signing or you're uh, you know you're selling and things like that. You know, uh, knowing that players tend to um, regress towards the mean in, in this measure, you want to find players that are, you know, have, have uh, fewer goals than they're expected because you know the following year they're likely to score more the next, right? Um, so that's just kind of a simple example of uh, transfer market arbitrage, and you're really starting to see that over in Europe now. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, do you know how I play this? <coughs> Uh, 
Here you go. So there's this particular goal that was scored in the, the Women's World Cup last year uh, by uh, my favorite player on the planet, Carly Lloyd, um, who shoots from literally half field in the World Cup final and scores. Um, it's really pretty amazing. I was lucky enough to be in the stadium for this one um, after quite a, uh, a uh, nightmare of a, a travel situation to get out to Vancouver. But um, if you were to pop this shot into anybody, anybody's expected goals model, uh, especially if it's worth their, uh, you know, worth their, uh, their salt, um, this, you know, would have um, would have quite a low expected goals, right? You know, it's less than one, it's less than half a one, and you know, it's going to be a decimal with a lot of leading zeros, right? Um, but you know that because she took that shot. Um, that suddenly, because that player, who's a very smart player, once she realizes that there's an opportunity to shoot here, all of a sudden, you know it shouldn't be that low because she's made the decision. It's such an outlier that you realize um, that uh, you know these expected goals models are kind of flawed because it, it, there's a, a, a selection bias that's going on here. She she decided to shoot from there, you know. Um, and it's uh, quite a bit different from, from other shots. Um, so one of these other things is, um, you know, kind of there's this, uh, you know, uh, this availability of her stick. It's, you know, it's a mental shortcut that relies on immediate examples that come to a given person's mind. Um, and this is also, you know, while you have kind of this Carly Lloyd ridiculous goal on one hand, which uh, shows that, you know, maybe we should trust players a little bit, this also suggests that maybe we shouldn't. Um, what you'll notice is that players, um, uh, that uh, have shot and scored a few very long distance shots during a season, um, they will continue to shoot those no matter what. They know that they hit that one the first time and now I'm going to hit that 30 more times in the season. It drives coaches nuts, um, but that player is convinced that because they scored that one goal uh, from that ridiculous situation that they can score that again. They don't really realize um, that, um, you know, the, the luck that kind of went into that first one. And also, you know, in terms of seven minutes left, i got a little bit to get out here. Um, but, uh, um, <coughs> lost my train of thought. Um, but let's move on. Um, so to kind of get into the social engineering bit, um, one of the main things I'd like say is that doing, doing analytics is not the same as disruptive thinking. Um, Analytics will teach you that certain behaviors are good or bad, right? Or efficient you know, um, uses of the ball versus inefficient uses of the ball. It shows you that corner kicks suck, right? Corner kicks are scored 2% of the time. But actually, you know, corner kicks are an opportunity, right? Is if you, uh, you know, can buck that trend and you can convert your corner kicks not at 2% but at 3% and, you know, uh, you know, put that advantage over the course of an entire season, Right, that's a huge advantage. Those are free goals, right? Um, so these basic kind of um, you know breakdowns and that analytics frequently gets us and even gives us some insight on things. Um, it's not the same and it's not that as useful as kind of thinking kind of critically about it sometimes, um, which kind of gets me to the speaking industry language stuff. Uh, I have to start to sprint through some of this, um, but uh, you know I frequently will. Uh, you know, uh, just like I was talking about earlier, our, our scouting reports, while they do have some numbers in them, they uh, try to focus on giving us very, uh, you know, giving very English language, soccer wording kind of uh, tactical explanations on certain things. And that's been resonating with coaches. One great example is letting coaches name metrics. They love that, it gives them ownership of them. They're always wanting to know how, they, how our team performed in their, their particular metric after the game. Um, simple versus complex models, I talk about this all the time. Um, I have a, you know, uh, none of our models are, are super sophisticated, uh, and that's because I need to explain them, right? You know, I can build the, the fanciest neural network that's, you know, building some, you know, really cool shit, uh, but if I've got a coach or a decision maker who needs to understand how I'm, you know, uh, wants to trust this stuff enough to be able to make decisions on it, I need to explain it. Um, so frequently you kind of have this trade-off between I can build this fancy super predictive model or this slightly more simple, maybe slightly less predictive, but way more explainable model. And that's been way more effective. 
Um, other stuff, uh, measuring units of tangible things, um, you know, that's kind of back to the expected goals bit too, you know. Um, it's, uh, I don't really love it as a metric. I, I tend to think of it as a unit or a currency. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, liking to explain certain things as, oh, if we make this sort of decision, we're playing this certain way, I think this is worth this many goals, right? So coaches love goals. Um, other stuff, uh, getting to um, uh, social engineering bits. Um, it's really difficult to be wrong in this profession, right? Uh, you know, when you're wrong once, all of a sudden, everybody thinks you're going to be wrong all the time. Do you hear me now? <laughs> um, I, won't, I won't get to that last video, so you can just turn the audio off. Um, but, uh, yeah. Hey, Jesse, I've, been, I've had my audio mute Sorry, because I didn't phone. want to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, is it a difficult industry to be, uh, to be wrong in, things like that, um, uh, it's, uh, it's tough to operate in. Uh, other stuff, uh, this one I like, um, this is uh, from Darren Mori and the Undoing Project, which I completely recommend. Uh, the, owners are, uh, uh, the owners of, I assume, basketball teams often made their money from disrupting fields where most of the conventional wisdom is bullshit, is a great quote. Uh, and I think it's really uh, exciting for people getting into this industry is because I think that the nature of uh, sports ownership in the future is going to be this newer money uh, from people that are much more comfortable using analytics to drive decisions. Uh, so people like us are going to have way more opportunities in the future, at least according to this savant. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, it's a great example. Uh, it's from this uh, the. Google DeepMind challenge match of the game of Go, um, where there was this particular move, move 37 in the second game, uh, that the computer made uh, that pretty much every single analyst on broadcast thought it was a mistake. It was so off the deep end um, that, uh, that even the, uh, you know, uh, Lee here uh, sat there for like 15 minutes in, in disbelief. You should find the Google video. and. Um, and it's something that, uh, at least, kind of, we're in this situation now where uh, analysts are very much in the industry of confirming beliefs, right? They want coaches are just looking to uh, double check their thoughts against your numbers, right? Uh, it's really hard for um, you know coaches to um, start to accept things that are completely off the cuff or seems to be something completely crazy. We're not there yet, but it seems like through um, kind of the uh, you know the the direction that some deep learning stuff is going in, uh, we could start to get there soon. Um, so I think that I'll, I'll skip this last bit uh, and I'll say thank you. And I don't know if I have any time for questions. But yeah, a couple minutes. So if cool. we take a couple. <clears throat> yes. So your own Michael Bradley did that outlier play too. And uh, yeah, that was uh, quite a goal. I wish I was there. Um, uh, what's uh, really interesting about that one is after he scored that, so you look at his TFC games in the last couple games, what did he do? He right. shot a little bit more frequently. Right. <laughs> right. Right. We have time for probably one more question, but you got it. Um, you talked about the benefits of going with a simple model over a complex model. Is there ever a scenario where you build some really um, complex neural network shit and then just fit like a simple linear model or random forest to those predictions to see um, how close you can get to just reverse engineering that? Uh, yeah, totally. Um, sometimes these, uh, you know, these, these uh, different kind of projects I work on are, uh, they get a little bit too academic too quickly sometimes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so like I'm building a, a possession classifier using a, a, a neural network right now. And it's okay, it's getting better results than anything else I've done. But actually if I just like hard code a couple heuristics into some like, um, uh, like just like very basic if, if then statements even. Like I can, oh, does this possession have this type of pass or this one type of pass, it doesn't have to. Like you can get something that's almost as good and it's way more explainable. Um, so. Like if, like if a like coach is asking, oh, Devin, why was this pa this possession you know, classified as this? Like I can't walk them through the you know uh, hidden model here you know, with all these nodes in the, the neural network, but I can say, oh, it had a long ball that went across the field, right? That's easier to code, and it's way easier to explain to a coach.
All right, thank you, everybody. Devin, you could probably go on for hours. We appreciate your time. So thank you.